Okay, we're going to get started. Hello and welcome to the webinar on ecological nutrient management for organic production in the Western region. This is the first presentation in the Organic Farming and Soil Health in the Western U.S. webinar series. And this series is organized by the Organic Farming Research Foundation and hosted by eOrganic with funding from Western SARE. I'm your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic. eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find all of them on our website at eExtension, um, that's extension.org, and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. The webinar will last about an hour, and when it is over, we'll have 30 minutes for questions. This webinar will be presented by Mark Schoenbeck, who is a research associate at the Organic Farming Research Foundation. Mark has worked for the last 31 years as a researcher, consultant, and educator about organic farming and sustainable agriculture. He also works with the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. So, um, without any further ado, I am going to hand over the remote control of the screen to Mark Schoenbeck. Okay. So uh, today we'll be uh, talking about uh, nutrient management and soil health. Yeah, uh, we're looking at nutrient management uh, for crops, soil, and the environment, and uh, try to focus uh, some of the uh, webinar on specifically on the Western region. Um, organic Farming Research Foundation undertook a, an extensive survey of organic farmers and um, this is a nationwide survey, and in the Western region, there were over 500 uh, respondents. And trends were generally similar in that soil health was the most commonly cited uh, priority for uh, research into organic systems. And um, a very high priority also was specifically fertility and nutrient management. And that was similar to the uh, nationwide priorities. Um, but what we've also seen is that there are some specifics that really stood out. Uh, for example, how does soil life cycle nutrients in uh, arid desert climates, uh, which are uh, true for a good part of the West? Uh, and what are the best nitrogen fixing cover crops for either arid uh, dryland or uh, drip irrigated fields in the in the West? Um, and then some uh, interest in liquid fertilizer management to reduce nitrogen leaching. That's uh, particularly in, important in areas with a lot of winter rainfall and potential for leaching. Um, and then uh, widespread interest in crop varieties that need less nitrogen and outcompete weeds. So just some basics. Uh, we'll kind of go over these fairly quickly. Uh, the, there will be in your notes. Um, so healthy living soils, they have a number of very important functions related to nutrients. And one is to simply retain and recycle plant nutrients so they're not lost out of the system uh, and ups from the nutrient reserves in the organic matter. And uh, also to minimize nutrient losses, uh, thereby protecting water quality. And there's an old... Um, time honored saying among organic growers, feed the soil and the soil will feed the plant. And uh, while this cannot be relied on to meet all crop needs at all times in a healthy soil, the action of the soil life on the organic matter will meet the majority of crop nutrient needs and thereby reduce fertilizer input needs. Well, here's some of the nutrient dynamics in the living soil. Um, all the inputs, whether it's fertilizers, especially organic fertilizers, uh, manure, amendments, plant residues, anything that's returning to the soil, uh, is processed through the soil food web or the soil life. The bacteria and fungi jump on those inputs first and then uh, various predators, uh, protozoa, nematodes, small insects, earthworms, etc., in successive uh, uh, tiers of the uh, soil food web. Uh, they will continue to cycle and gradually release nutrients to the crops. And one of the things that happens is a dynamic two-way exchange between the soil organic matter, which is like a nutrient storehouse, and the soil life. Uh, sometimes when there's a surplus of nitrogen, if there's also sufficient carbon, soil life will um, save that nitrogen and other nutrients, uh, such as, um, uh, especially sulfur and phosphorus, in that organic matter. 
Also, soil life, soil organisms, plant roots very gradually work on soil minerals. They gradually weather those minerals to release nutrients, um, bring nutrients into circulation. So it's really a two-way exchange. Uh, researchers have documented plants releasing anywhere from 10 percent up to at least 30 percent and some reports even higher of their photosynthetic product of all the uh, organic matter that it, uh, this, the plant creates through photosynthesis goes down the plant out the roots to feed the soil life and in return the beneficial organisms in the root zone enhance plant nutrition and water uptake uh, the mycorrhizal fungi are a particularly important group of soil organisms they directly assist the moisture and nutrient uptake and they uh, ward off plant diseases. In exchange, you can see it looks like they're being a bit parasitic. They got those uh, of hyphae and arbiters inside the root. Uh, and yes, they are taking some of the plant's nourishment even before it gets exuded, but in exchange, they're doing a tremendous service. Okay, so when your soil health is not up to snuff, a uh, number of things happen uh, so that the crop does not get as much nourishment. If you have inorganic organic matter inputs or prolonged bare fallow, the soil life gets kind of starved, so it gets it diminishes. Excessive tillage can uh, create subsurface hard pans and can further burn up organic matter. And if you're using a lot of soluble fertilizer, uh, it not only bypasses the soil life, but it does have uh, negative impacts on on the um, the soil organisms themselves, and one of the things that's happened that's changed over um, the last twenty years in mainstream um, agricultural circles is a growing appreciation of the importance of soil life and soil health in crop nutrition and also nutrient cycling and uh, nutrient retention. And on the other hand, there is a lot of kind of leftover from the 20th century uh, in which um, there was a lot of emphasis on just feeding the plant directly with soluble fertilizers. And although this could compensate for poor soil health in the short to medium term, it does contribute to the long-term problems of inadequate soil life and uh, poor soil health. Uh, as I said, in the 21st century, there's a widespread appreciation of the importance of soil life. And yet, as we'll see a little later, uh, the actual mechanics of developing uh, recommendations for uh, nutrient management and uh, soil health, uh, I mean, and, and crop uh, production have not yet caught up with this new understanding. So um, there is a feedback cycle between soil health and crop nutrients in that the healthier your soil, the more you do to build the soil health through cover crops, crop rotations, appropriate organic inputs, etc., the more that soil can feed the crop and sustain crop growth without having to put a lot of uh, nutrients directly on. Now, very often in practice, you're going to need to do some fertilization. However, when you use quite a bit of soluble fertilizers, there is a negative aspect to this feedback loop on soil health. So that's um, often a trade-off that farmers, organic and otherwise, need to address. It's how soil in the whole process, and the whole nutrient cycle. Uh, as residues break down, soil life converts it into various forms of organic matter. Now it's actually a continuum from organic matter that is turning over very quickly within the course of a growing season or within the, a few weeks, all the way to highly stable organic matter uh, that remains in the soil for centuries or millennia. But for the sake of simplicity, we're showing two pools here. Some, some uh, uh, soil scientists use three pools, active, slow, and stable. But the main thing to remember is that the more active forms are the reservoir for nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and small amounts of other anionic or negatively charged nutrients, while the more stable forms of organic matter expand the soil's cation exchange capacity. It's the negative charges on the clays, the stable organic matter, and uh, organic mineral uh, nutrient complex. And this uh, stable organic matter then um, holds on to the positively charged nutrients that they're less likely to leach. And that includes ammonium, nitrogen, 
as well as potassium, calcium, magnesium, and some of the micronutrients. And then some of the micronutrients are also uh, incorporated into the active organic matter. So in organic farming, um, the uh, way to feed the soil is to feed the soil life a diverse, balanced diet. And the staple of that diet is a living plant, the plants that are grown directly in the soil during the course of the crop rotation, the, the cash crops and the cover crops. And um, the other inputs, the compost, the manure, the organic mulches, and other organic amendments that are brought in from elsewhere um, into the uh, crop are um, like supplements. And they are necessary, and they complement and enhance the effect of the cover crops and the residues. So what is soil testing? It's basically just a snapshot, a standard soil test. It gives you a snapshot in time when it was sampled, what the pH or the acidity is, what the cation exchange capacity. And most soil tests report plant available phosphorus, calcium, potassium, magnesium, sometimes micronutrients, and usually some estimate of percent organic matter, often based on loss on ignition. And more and more farmers are using additional tests to fine tune their nutrient management and also uh, monitoring and managing soil health. And one thing is that soil tests don't, uh, standard soil tests don't usually report nitrogen per se, soluble nitrogen, because it's very rapidly. Every time it rains, it drops. Every time plants take it up, a lot of nutrients up, it drops sharply. And on the other hand, during a period of moist but not saturated or leaching conditions and active soil life, you will get a lot of mineralization or after fertilizer application, the soluble nitrogen will go way up. However, uh, there are particular stages in crop development that are uh, very, when it's very useful to take a, a, a soil nitrate test. Uh, for instance, a pre side dress uh, nitrate test for corn, sometimes either a pre plant or a pre side dress test for some vegetables as well. And more recently, um, there have been some new tests that directly relate to soil life and soil health. One is estimations of plant available nitrogen from organic matter. This is not measuring the actual soluble nitrogen, but measuring or estimating that organic nitrogen that is likely to be released during the course of the season. Another why, uh, test coming into wider and wider use is the Solvita respiration test. It's a measure of soil microbiological activity, or uh, you might think of it as uh, organic matter mineralization. We'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a bit. And then there's the Cornell Comprehensive Assessment of Soil Health. Uh, that integrates a number of different parameters, including these two I just discussed and some of the standard soil test parameters. And there are various soil health scorecards, and these are designed regionally. Um, if you're in New Mexico, you don't want to use the, the uh, soil health card developed by, let's say, Massachusetts Extension. Uh, get it from New Mexico Extension. If they don't have it, you know, check out Arizona, Nevada, or somewhere nearby. So applying these soil tests to organic systems, um, there are a lot of ways it can be used uh, using the pH to um, estimate how much lime you need is valid to all systems. And one thing about standard soil test recommendations is they are based to a large extent in most cases on research conducted during the late 20th century and under that 20th century paradigm of how crops respond to added nutrients on, at different soil test levels on conventionally managed soils. And these are soils where perhaps the soil life has not been maintained as uh, effectively as uh, a well-managed organic field, or indeed, even non-organic fields where the farmer has a strong commitment to uh, maintaining soil health and uses cover crops, uh, et cetera, good rotations and, and uh, some organic as well as non-organic inputs, you will see a higher level of activity even in those circumstances. So the nitrogen on the soil test recommendations are often not based on what crop is grown and what are the yield goals. In other words, if you want to grow 200 bushel per acre corn, they say 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen. If you want to grow potatoes and you're aiming for, let's say, 15 tons per acre, perhaps it might be 130, 150 pounds per acre, et cetera. 
P and K are based on soil test levels and the crop grown, and as I say, that uh, history of research. Micronutrients are recommended as needed based on soil test results. Very often, a given lab will emphasize those micronutrients that are frequently an issue in that region. In rainy areas, for instance, boron is often deficient, whereas in dry areas, it's often amp uh, sufficient. Um, now, historically, these recommended rates have often exceeded crop uptake because half or more of the applied NPK is either lost or tied up or otherwise does not get to the crop. The challenge that organic growers face is that biologically based nutrient cycling, especially nitrogen and phosphorus, is complex and it can be a little difficult to estimate. So it's very easy to apply either too little for the crop or to play, apply too much and then thereby have some losses to leaching. Uh, organic inputs are also not consistent. You get a bag of 10, 10, 10, you know what it has, but if you get a bag of uh, compost or a, a truckload of compost, um, the nutrient contents may be quite variable from source to source year to year. And again, I mentioned the lack of research in organically managed soils. I want to say that I have been very pleased with how much research has been conducted in recent years and how it is beginning to be applied to um, uh, nutrient recommendations for organic and sustainable systems. Uh, or Oregon State and Pacific Northwest Extension Services um, are really leading the charge on this and uh, for sustainable nutrient management they are now no longer recommending that you add more P and K when the soil test level is high which is a uh, high is considered optimum. Okay um, so this is a little bit more on applying soil test results to organic systems. Uh, an interesting research question uh, is when you have more biological activity how much does that modify the crop's response to added nutrients? For instance, if you have a low soil test value for phosphorus or potassium, do you really need the 100 units of phosphate and 200 units of potash that your extension soil test or private lab might recommend? If it's biologically active, maybe you only need half as much or a third as much. Um, that's a very interesting question, and I think some research has started to uh, reveal the answers, but uh, more is needed. Uh, some, I want to say that soil tests are valuable to organic producers because they're very good for monitoring trends and for flagging really clear deficiencies or imbalances. And I would just recommend the organic or supplement these uh, information with field observations and with crop foliar nutrient analyses. Uh, the foliar nutrient analysis shows you what the crop actually sees. I had an example in my own garden once many years ago where I was doing a little nutrient management study and the soil test came back low in phosphorus and it came back medium in potassium and calcium, both of which are slightly below optimum. But when I went and tested the, the foliage on three different crops, um, P and K and calcium were all right in the middle of the sufficiency range. So despite the somewhat low readings, the crops were getting enough. This is an organically managed, although not certified, organic garden. Um, another way to look at the one well, way to approach this is to do side by side trials with and without uh, fertilizer. Uh, so, if an organic grower says, "Well, do I really need another three hundred pounds of feather meal to grow this crop to a satisfactory yield?" It's really worth doing a trial where you compare with and without. And organic managed soil management is definitely a balancing act because uh, there are two processes going on at the same time in the soil. Uh, mineralization, which is the decomposition of organic matter to release nutrients, and that converts some of the organic matter to carbon dioxide. So yeah, it is consuming organic matter. And on the one hand, you don't want to burn up your soil's organic matter, but on the other hand, you need to consume some to release some of that reserve nutrients to support crop growth. And at the same time, you want to be building and maintaining adequate organic matter levels, which is a critical factor in soil health. The good news is that um, research studies have, have uh, documented that when you build the soil health through a good integrated organic approach, you're not just relying on putting on piles of manure compost, but you're growing lots of cover crops and you're using inputs according to soil tests and you have diversified your rotation and uh, reducing tillage when practical, 
that this will result in a higher level of both mineralization, in other words, nutrient supply to the crops, and soil organic matter stabilization. So your stable organic matter and your cation exchange capacity and other benefits thereof continue to rise, or at least stay at an optimal level once that optimum is reached. So here's just a few organic and natural mineral fertilizers. I don't need to spend time on the details of what they are. Um, suffice it to say that those are those are allowed under USDA organic standards, at least under certain conditions. You don't want to be adding boron unless you can document the need for it. Um, for the main uses of these is as a supplement. They're a supplement to the basic soil health management practices of organic farming. And uh, they're used to restore depleted soils uh, to help with that restoration. As I say, the, again, the, the, the living plant growth and uh, uh, supplement with compost is the main way to re restore depleted soil. But you also may have a specific nutrient deficiency or imbalance that requires certain more concentrated amendments. Of course, you need to adjust pH. If you're growing blueberries, you don't want it at 7. If you're growing vegetables, you don't want it down at 5. And you have to apply the appropriate amendments. Um, then you want to be sure that you're sustaining crop yields because there's nothing worse than soil for soil health than to have the farmer go out of business and have a subdivision go up on that uh, piece of land. So um, definitely need to take care of the yield in the bottom line. And once you've reached this optimum or soil test level or high soil test level, you want to, in the long run, be replenishing the nutrients you're removing from har through harvest so that you're not mining the land. Okay, so uh, these are just some share goals of good organic nutrient management is you want to maintain crop yields and quality, uh, protect soil health, water quality, and climate. In other words, you don't want um, excesses of nitrogen and phosphorus in particular to have environmental impacts. As you build the soil health, you'll be reducing the need for inputs. So that's, uh, that is a nutrient management strategy and goal. Uh, another one is once you're at that optimal level, uh, then you just maintain it. And if you have a nutrient excess, you've either or the shot uh, with initial uh, amendments or when you um, first started farming the land, it tested, tested very high in phosphorus or potassium. Um, you can just draw down those excesses and then you want to avoid having them build up again. Um, now we'll get on to the Western region. Now, uh, a number of these slides will have broad generalizations and uh, there is a really excellent NRCS uh, publication that talks about the uh, climate soil regions, and it will be listed um, in the uh, supplemental notes to this presentation. And that will um, provide much finer and more precise information than I have here. But the thing about the Western region is it's just a wide diversity of um, soils and climate so it's it's more challenging to adapt the new the basic principles of organic nutrient management to a specific uh, situation and so it's and, and also your uh, know your climate the maritime pacific northwest that would be west of the cascades in oregon and washington most of the soils are quite fertile and pretty easy to work uh, the biggest challenge is you have a lot of rainfall in the winter, and if you have leftover uh, nitrogen from uh, production, and this can happen in organic production as well, uh, very subject to leaching, uh, ha impacts on water quality, and of course, then you're losing uh, the benefits of that nitrogen for the next crop. Um, Mediterranean climates, uh, the maritime climates are within that Mediterranean range, but then extending to a larger area, much of California, uh, western half or so of Washington, Oregon. You have the winter rains again, but you have a very uh, moisture-limited summer. There's more extended dry periods in the summer. Um, so um, again, uh, those winter rains, even in areas we have only 15 or 20 inches, if most of it falls in the winter, and uh, especially in regions where you have a fairly cold climate and most of that winter precipitation is snow and you're not growing anything, um, until the spring, uh, you're going to have a, a chance uh, uh, to lose that nitrogen during snowmelt. Um, volcanic soils, there are parts of the Cascades, parts of Idaho, and mu much of Hawaii 
volcanic soils or andesols are very interesting in that they have really good organic matter, a good fertility, excellent structures, just the nature of them. They really hold on to organic matter, but they also hold on rather tightly to phosphorus. So you may need to supplement phosphorus to a greater degree. Uh, and one interesting research question that comes to mind to me is, to what extent, instead of pouring the phosphorus into these soils and having it get tied up, um, to what extent can we mobilize some of that uh, phosphorus through uh, mycorrhizal fungi and other soil biological strategies? So some other ar areas of the semi-arid region, the interesting thing is when you get to Montana um, and Wyoming and Colorado, more of that limited rainfall is occurring in the summer. So it's a different rainfall pattern than the Palouse area of Washington, for example. Uh, in, the war in these uh, more northern parts of the interior west where the precipitation is, say, 10 to 15 inches a year, tend to have prairie soils, a lot of mollusols um, that are fertile, high in organic matter. But again, the main limitation is that uh, low moisture. They do tend to be alkaline. And this is kind of the opposite, uh, kind of similar to the andesol, excuse me, in that the um, the calcium levels, the high calcium levels, tend to tie up phosphorus. Again, there's a, a difficulty in getting that phosphorus plant available. Um, so cover crop and crop rotation options are, can be moisture limited. Interesting research, uh, including some NRCS uh, conservation innovation grant funded studies in, in eastern Washington and a uh, SERI study in Montana working with a lot of farmers to try to determine the best way to manage cover crops. You get those long-term soil health benefits and that a little extra nitrogen from the legume without consuming so much moisture that the immediately following grain crop is uh, water limited and has lower yield. Things get even more challenging in the really arid regions um, where there's less than 10 inches of rain a year. These soils are called aridosols, which means they're dry zone uh, desert soils tend to be saline or alkaline. They can be shallow or poorly structured. Production is probably dependent on irrigation, and there you have irrigation water quality challenges, mostly around salinity. Uh, and then, of course, in the tundra and the permafrost regions of Alaska, the, the cold, the very short growing season limits both soil biology and crop production. Because there's very, very little soil organic, a very little, little mineralization of the organic matter in such a cold climate, you have, um, you tend to have very high levels of organic matter. And, and the flip side of it is that those organic matter levels are very vulnerable to rapid loss from tillage. If you, if you decide to till up a field up there to do some uh, uh, cropping and also climate changes as uh, temperatures warm in the Arctic, it's gonna really adversely affect um, the uh, organic matter in those soils. Okay, so um, out of this huge diversity of uh, climates and production systems, types of crops grown, uh, we, won't be able to we won't be able to cover it all. So uh, I will be looking at uh, primarily vegetable crop production in the Pacific Northwest in California that would cover the maritime and the Mediterranean climates um, where moisture is somewhat limited in the summer. Sometimes you do need irrigation, but you do have the heavy rainfalls in the winter. And we'll do a little bit on um, cereal grain production in inland semi-arid areas uh, from uh, the uh, Palouse region of uh, uh, Washington and interior Oregon all the way across uh, into the uh, uh, interior high plains and intermountain areas. Of course, there's a lot of rangeland livestock produced in the West, and there are a lot of tree fruits, vineyards, and other specialty crops that do really well because the dry summers limit diseases. And um, so there's been both some really uh, successful uh, irrigated production in most drier areas, and um, of course, along the coast, probably rain fed. Cover those in detail today. So nitrogen is the most challenging nutrient in organic systems. It's probably the most challenging nutrient in all systems. Uh, but organic crops are particularly often nitrogen limited um, because in organic systems, the grower is really dependent on soil biology 
to cycle nitrogen and release it to crops in a timely manner. It's a little harder to predict than when you say, okay, I'm going to use ammonium nitrate and I am going to split applications and put on just the amount I need and band it near the crop row. So in that way, the conventional farmer who is really wants to take good care of the nutrients can spoon feed it. But in organic systems, verbal lining and soil biology to provide it uh, to the crop. Very often, organic crops are nitrogen limited. That's, that's a number one, probably that and weeds are the two leading causes of uh, yield limitation uh, in organic systems. If the soil life is depleted, for instance, you're just early in the phases of transition from conventional to organic, or you're entering a new field where the soil health wasn't very high to begin with, um, you will not have as much nitrogen from the soil life and you'll need to add more. And then there are areas, uh, arid regions, of course, where you have inherently low fertility and lower biological activity. Um, if uh, crop residues and amendments that are poor in nitrogen or high in carbon are added to the soil, this will also... Um, uh, lead to uh, N, uh, nitrogen limitation. Uh, that's a, a pitfall that a lot of beginning organic farmers uh, fall into. Although once it's happened once, then they'll tend to go the other way and make sure there's plenty of nitrogen and uh, apply a lot of organic fertilizer. If you're growing a crop with a high nitrogen demand, uh, two examples would be field corn for grain or uh, head brassicas. They just need huge amounts of nitrogen uh, and they are most prone to that uh, N deficiency. Again, um, uh, winter rains leaching out plant available nitrogen. We'll talk about a specific example of that a little later. And then in early spring when the soil is cool, uh, that slows down mineralization. Um, even in a very healthy soil, that could be an issue, especially when you're growing something like spring broccoli. Okay, here's a couple of um, other challenges. Um, when you reduce tillage and grow high biomass cover crops, this is the best combination for soil health. Um, a number of studies have given, have shown the greatest soil health benefits in organic systems that maximize cover cropping and reduce tillage to the greatest extent practical. But very often this reduces plant available nitrogen. It does tend to slow mineralization unless you're growing a pure legume cover crop. These systems don't have the highest yields. In fact, they can be quite it reduced. Even snap bean, which fixes some of its own nitrogen, uh, can get, find itself short of nitrogen if it's grown in a residue that's very high in carbon. And as I mentioned, um, once burned, twice shy, uh, many organic farmers say, okay, I know this crop needs lots of nitrogen, so I'm just going to apply it. And using things like feather meal, poultry litter, um, limited amount of Chile and sodium nitrate. It's a natural mineral sodium uh, nitrate fertilizer that uh, is allowed up to 20% uh, of your projected nitrogen needs in certified organic systems. But all of these rapidly releasing nitrogen sources do have the same potential to leach nitrate, um, to denitrify and release nitrous oxide, which is very harmful to the climate. Um, and also when you've raised your soluble nitrogen levels from any source, it will accelerate the decomposition of soil organic matter and it can reduce some of the most beneficial plant root microbe interactions. I was talking a little bit about broccoli. This is a very heavy feeder and this actually creates a very interesting dilemma because studies in Washington state and also California on different rates of organic nitrogen as fertile as feather meal or other um, concentrated organic sources like blood meal and uh, meat meal, etc., have shown a linear response to yield up to at least 200 pounds per acre. And this is uh, uh, two years of studies at five sites, including both maritime and semi-arid uh, zone climates. Um, now, each pound of feather meal a night, which is, these, these fertilizers are not cheap. You're paying six dollars, over six dollars a pound for the night. Uh, from the nitrogen in these sources. And yet the broccoli yield response pays for it, as you can see from 11 to 88 pounds for every added pound of nitrogen uh, at a market value of $2.50 a pound, uh, that pays for itself several fold. However, when you get those high application rates, uh, the soil nitrate got to very uh, substantial levels, which was sufficient uh, to increase the potential for leaching. 
in another study in California, uh, this is a modeling study, but it's based on sufficient field observations uh, to be fairly reliable. Um, again, the, uh, the sweet spot in terms of economic return was a little over 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen uh, with uh, various uh, feather and, and meat and blood meals. And the, um, the researchers found that the broccoli crop doesn't use all that nitrogen. In fact, it can leach as much as 180 pounds of nitrate nitrogen per acre and in pounds were emitted as nitrous oxide. And that looks like all the fertilizer that you put on. And yet, um, it does not take into account the nitrogen that was released by the soil life. So probably the total amount of nitrogen available to the crop was between three and 400 pounds. Uh, but in any case, uh, the amount of nitrogen needed to get that ideal uh, result in terms of crop yield and net return was sufficient to uh, really increase the risks to uh, uh, groundwater and even to uh, climate uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, when they provided two thirds of that through compost or cover crops, uh, it reduced the nitrogen losses to, uh, quite considerably, but um, as, as nitro, excuse me, it reduced the nitrous oxide losses considerably, but the leaching was fairly similar to the all fertilizer treatment. So this is quite a challenging crop to grow sustainably. So a few tips uh, based again, partly on research and partly on uh, uh, this experience that farmers have uh, uh, reported. Uh, if you feed the soil life with a diversity of materials that are kind of a moderate carbon to nitrogen ratio, like our 20 to 30 to one, it's like a balanced diet. It's like um, a person who eats a little meat and a lot of uh, vegetables and some whole grains is a lot healthier than one who try to subsist just on carbohydrates or just on meat. And that's similar to soil life. Um, if it gets nothing but rye residue, it's not getting enough nitrogen. If it's getting nothing but uh, manure and vetch residues, it's getting too much relative to the carbon. And when you have that balanced mix and a diversity of sources, the soil life uh, thrives better. It, it um, enhances the uh, uh, stable organic matter better and it will recycle uh, cycles nutrients and holds nutrients better. Uh, reduce tillage when practical, uh, but only to the extent practical, practical it's uh, uh, strict no-till is often not feasible in organic systems. Um, so one, one strategy is to deliver the concentrated nitrogen in the crop rows. One way to do this is to broadcast the nitrogen and then go through with a bed shaper and you build the beds. Uh, a grower right here in Floyd, Virginia told me about that. Um, Kat Johnson is managing uh, a small-scale uh, organic vegetable farm uh, quite successfully and uh, mentioned that strategy. Another way is to just put drip irrigation lines down and uh, deliver organic liquid fertilizers, fish, fish, seaweed, so that you're feeding the crop right where it needs it. Um, another grower in our region... Uh, has tried uh, mowing the, co uh, the cover crop and, and putting a clear plastic just for two days to solarize the crop, make sure it's good and dead. This is a summer cover crop ahead of fall brassicas. Uh, other researchers in the Northeast um, have used opaque tarps. Now, these are both out of the Western region, but I think that these are uh, strategies to consider because it affects cover crop kill without tillage and it does release uh, nutrients quite effectively if your uh, cover crop has legume in it. A uh, long-term solution, I think, is we need to start breeding some of these vegetables for greater nutrient use efficiency. And there's evidence from uh, uh, corn breeding that this can be done. So nitrogen is challenging for all farmers and that's because plants use it in the soluble forms. What the plants take up is the nitrate and to some extent the ammonium. They're not gonna be able to just stick the roots right in the manure and take the organic nitrogen directly. So either soluble nitrogen in, in uh, conventional agriculture is directly applied or manure and other fairly highly uh, nutrient rich organic sources are processed through the soil life and then the soil life can uh, move organic nitrogen out of the active organic matter into these uh, nitrogen pools. Doesn't matter uh, how that nitrate and ammonium get there, but it is subject to leaching, leaching and denitrification. 
especially when soil life is depleted, soil life is below par, it's not able to draw in active organic matter as effectively, it's not able to process organic inputs. So a farmer to make a living will increase soluble nitrogen inputs, or in the case of an organic farmer, the faster release organic inputs, such as feather meal um, and uh, poultry litter, and that's only gonna increase these problems. This is a, um, again, this is a uh, conceptualized diagram. It is adopted, adapted largely from Sullivan uh, and a colleagues, uh, Oregon State University Extension Bulletin. Uh, that one, the full reference is, is in the uh, lecture notes, and I would uh, strongly recommend that because I was impressed with the degree to which that particular nutrient management uh, extension bulletin took account of soil life and soil health in making uh, nutrient recommendations. So one thing, um, it's really tricky, especially in organic systems, to match your nitrogen release to the crop demand. If it's there too fast, if it's, if it's released too early before the crop is growing, this is the crop um, nitrogen accumulation curve. It's slow for the first 20 to 30 days after planting, and then it's rapid during late vegetative development. And then once the, the, it's in fruit and seed development, it's more translocating its own nitrogen from the leaves into the uh, fruit and the grain. So this is when the crop needs the nitrogen during this rapid phase. So your ideal scheme would have a curve something like this, providing the nitrogen as is needed. A lot of organic inputs are very slow to release their nitrogen. You can get leaching there too because then it starts getting available late in the season and then the winter rains start and you're pretty much near harvest. Uh, so again, uh, you've had a loss of efficiency and uh, some leaching. This is a real life example uh, from some studies in, um, uh, done by uh, uh, University of California researchers, uh, uh, Joji Miromoto and colleagues. They are trying to optimize nutrient management in an organic vegetable uh, strawberry rotation. And in this example, strawberry was planted after broccoli. Broccoli was harvested earlier in this growing season and then there's a substantial broccoli residue. You just take the head and you have all this leaves and stem, and that has a substantial amount of nitrogen. So in addition to the broccoli leaving quite a bit of residual inorganic nitrogen in the soil, there was a further jump as the broccoli residues broke down. Meanwhile, strawberries are planted in late fall, but they don't really get going in terms of growth and nutrient consumption until the middle of the spring. Meanwhile, all this has been mineralized and these rainfalls have leached most of it out. So by the time the strawberry needs some nitrogen, the um, soil nitrate level is quite low and strawberry yields are often nutrient limited. Although in organic production, uh, uh, the organic strawberries have also been shown to be limited by diseases which further compromise root function. Uh, that's a little bit outside the, the uh, topic of this webinar, but um, that, that shows the challenges related to timing on nitrogen. So what if we could, uh, now we've we, we kind of seen how the soil life acts as the gatekeeper between um, organic nitrogen reserves and what's released and uh, what's released to the crops. What if that gatekeeper were right by the roots and it was able to just deliver what was needed right into the crop root zone and not waste a lot over here in the bulk soil? Um, this sounds like uh, just kind of uh, pipe dreaming, but in fact, there is some evidence that this can, this can uh, occur. Uh, another uh, uh, group, uh, Louise Jackson and a uh, colleague by the name of Bowles uh, have, and others in uh, California, University of California again, have been looking at organic tomato fields. They looked at 13 different fields in Central California and they saw three distinct scenarios. One was a nitrogen deficient nitrogen, the organic matter and microbial activity were below par. Uh, we're not at the ideal, and the tomatoes had a low yield. This is organic production, so they weren't using 10-10-10 uh, to make up the difference or, or ammonium nitrate or anything. Um, the other one is not, uh, nitrogen saturated, where the organic growers increased the inputs 
fields to make sure that their tomato had enough nitrogen. They got good yields, but there was quite a bit of soluble nitrogen um, and there was a high risk of nitrogen leaching. It was good microbial activity um, and the soil organic matters were reasonable, but uh, there was still that excess subject to leaching like we saw with the broccoli and the strawberry rotation. They found several fields that approach something called tight nutrient cycling or tight, uh, tightly coupled uh, cycling. If you take the bulk soil and measure the nitrate, it came out pretty low and you think, well, boy, this, this should be really deficient. But the uh, organic matter levels were high, both active and, and uh, uh, stable organic matter were plentiful. Microbial activity was high and diverse. And there was high yield with a minimal uh, risk of nitrogen leaching. So in that case, the, the gatekeeper was working right in the root zone and delivering nitrogen to the crop as needed without uh, having high uh, bulk soil levels. So how do we manage for this? Um, partly it's how the soil is fed. Again, that mixture of high and low carbon to nitrogen ratio materials, uh, diverse inputs, different cover crops, uh, different amendments. Um, you want to build the diversity of the soil. Now, if you're growing a crop that needs a lot of nitrogen, uh, in this case, this is, shows tomatoes again on a very sandy soil that has uh, relatively low nutrient holding capacity. Um, but you see a drip irrigation line down there. You can use that to drip fertigate. Now, I understand there have been some technical problems with some of the fertilizers clogging certain drip systems, although um, uh, vendors of these uh, fertilizers are working to come up with formulations that do not clog the system and deliver the nutrients effectively right in the crop row. So that's what you want to do. You want to increase the availability of nutrients right in the crop root zone. and um, those tightly cycled uh, fields, they did use small amounts of either Chilean nitrate or feather meal right in the crop row to deliver about 20 to 30 pounds of quick release nitrogen. So uh, it was partly the gatekeeper effect of the soil life, but partly also the strategy that the farmer used to say, instead of putting lots of fast release nitrogen over the whole field, let's just put a little bit right down the crop row. And then encouraging mycorrhizal fungi. I do that is just avoid over applying nitrogen and phosphorus. <clears throat> so some other zone tillage management strategies uh, uh, is strip tillage or zone tillage or ridge tillage is another uh, approach. This selectively stimulates um, organic matter mineralization and nitrogen release right in the crop rows while leaving the interrows, the alleys, undisturbed so that this organic matter remains stable. In other words, if we tilled out that whole field and it happened to have a lot of organic matter and let's pretend that instead of wheat residue, that was a, um, a cover crop with quite a bit of legume in it. If you tilled out the whole area, you get the whole soil area saturated in nitrogen. You have a big rain, it would all leach out. But if you till just right where you're going to plant your crop and then you plant the crop, um, you're keeping things more stable between the rows. Another way to do this is when you plant cover crops, alternate uh, the bed tops in a legume or a legume-rich uh, mixture, and then have the alleys in a grass that's going to tend to scavenge the nitrogen and also suppress weeds much better than the legume. So later on, they'll come, uh, uh, this field, after that cover crop was terminated, uh, this area was planted in organic brassicas, which could make good use of that nitrogen, and the alleys were in uh, mowed or rolled uh, sorghum sudan grass. So phosphorus, another big challenge. And this is because crops use about 4 to 10 pounds of nitrogen for every 1 pound of phosphorus, whereas manure and compost only provide 2 or 3 pounds of nitrogen per 1 pound of phosphorus. So if you use these materials, um, especially uh, compost that's based on manure, if you use these materials to meet your crop's nitrogen needs, the soil phosphorus will go through the roof. And several things that can happen when your phosphorus is in the very high range. Uh, the most serious on, for a small-scale farmer really trying to maximize soil health is the inhibition of the mycorrhizal fungi. Once you get into the very high zone range, you do tend to have um, – 
lower activity of these highly beneficial fungi. And although the crop will be getting plenty of nutrients if the soil is in a generally rich condition, there are other um, more subtle functions of those fungi that are very important that are lost under these circumstances. The very high phosphorus can tie up micronutrients, um, although with the compost you tend to get micronutrients as well as phosphorus, so that's less of a problem in organic systems, but it can occur. And of course, uh, once you got into the very high range, uh, phosphorus and runoff is an issue for surface water quality. So, um, replenishing nutrients. I talked about replenishing nutrients once you're at a high level. Um, some interesting uh, information out of uh, the um, Pacific Northwest uh, Extension Bulletin is how much nutrients are actually removed in typical harvests. And these are fairly high yields, eight tons per acre of broccoli, uh, 10 for sweet corn, 34 tons per acre of onions, et cetera. And if you look at this, it does take quite a bit of nitrogen, although not as much as um, the standard soil test recommendations. But look how little phosphorus is removed, even in a heavy yielding potato crop, only 26 pounds of elemental phosphorus or about 65 pounds of phosphate, P2O5. Uh, potassium removals are higher. Um, and if we use uh, a mixed compost, now 111 is a very roughly typical analysis of, of a compost that has a, a significant manure component. It's a fairly rich compost. Uh, a widely available poultry litter, litter fertilizer uh, is commercially available to organic farmers. It has a 543 analysis, and its recommended rate is about a ton per acre. Either of those will give you a total nitrogen input of 100 pounds. So that's not all, all going to be immediately available, but you will be at least replenishing half of the nitrogen. You could replenish the rest of the nitrogen with, um, with legume cover crops in the rotation. Um, and the potassium, uh, you're replenishing some of it, but look at the phosphorus. It is overshooting by quite a bit. Now, these are the recommended rates currently recommended by Oregon State University uh, for optimal, more high soil test levels. Since a high soil test usually implies the crop is not going to actually respond, they will often recommend uh, either not adding those nutrients or adding only a very small amount. And most recently, they emphasized that the amount of phosphorus added on a higher, very high test should be less than you expect to remove. So this is a challenge for organic producers is to get this, uh, get this nutrient balance uh, with those inputs. So you want to enjoy, adjust your amendment um, strategy to your soil test phosphorus levels. Remember, a little compost goes a long way. Um, and you do get a lot of multiple subtle benefits from putting on just a ton or two per acre of compost. It complements the effects of cover crops and a high biomass cash crops in building and maintaining soil life and soil organic matter. If your soil is testing low in phosphorus, yeah, use your nitrogen to provide all your NPK uh, uh, of it, and that will help build the soil up to the uh, desired medium to high range. If your soil is high or optimum, you adjust the compost to just maintain that level and then grow legumes to provide more nitrogen uh, or use um, low phosphorus organic fertilizer such as feather meal, which is 13.00. Or for very high surplus soil, you want to use compost very sparingly. Think of it as an inoculant. Or you could just use compost to make compost tea. And that will also um, help uh, provide the uh, microbial benefits of the compost without um, adding up a lot of nutrients. Okay, cover crops. Uh, this is a vital tool for organic nutrient management because they feed soil life, they build soil organic matter. Um, of course, the nitrogen fixation, and they also retain soluble nitrogen. Deep-rooted crops of any kind, especially deep-rooted cover crops, will retrieve that that's, uh, subsoil nitrogen before it leaches and is lost. Um, and the legumes enhance the availability of phosphorus, and buckwheat does as well, but the grasses enhance the availability of potassium. 
This is true when your soil test levels are below, below optimal. Like you get a medium soil test, phosphorus or potassium, the cover crops will tend to make them more available to your following crop. Uh, on the other hand, if, you're, if you have optimal or excessive P or K, uh, the cover crop will never aggravate that excess because uh, it'll just recycle what's there. It will not be adding it from outside like it does with, with carbon and nitrogen. So just a few quick things again. These are kind of um, uh, conceptual slides based on a large body of research. Uh, as you choose your cover crops, you want to look at what your production and environmental goals are and then uh, choose accordingly. The nitrogen fixing potential, um, legume of course is high, and in the mix it's actually just as high because the, the demand for nitrogen by the non-legume stimulates the nitrogen fixation by the legume. So a mix will sometimes actually fix more nitrogen than a pure legume, which will just recycle what is already there. I say limited and not zero under grasses because there is some evidence that um, some of the summer grasses, such as uh, pearl millet in particular, will host in its rhizosphere, nitrogen fixing bacteria that will provide 10, 20, 30 pounds per acre, maybe even more. And in fact, some land races of, of field corn do the same and can fix up to almost half of their own nitrogen. Nitrogen recovery, of course, uh, the, the lucrucifers are excellent for that. The deep rooted radish and canola can clear the whole soil profile to a depth of five feet of excess uh, nitrate, pretty, pretty much stop leaching. Uh, grasses are good at this too, especially the deep-rooted ones. Again, on that residue carbon-nitrogen ratio, grass by itself is quite high. Both legume and crucifer are low and therefore release nitrogen rapidly and can carry a higher risk of uh, leaching and uh, nitrous oxide. Okay, another conceptual diagram. Um, as the crop matures, its effects on the soil will shift. The carbon to nitrogen ratio of a, of a young cover crop tends to be quite low, as low as 10 or 12. As it matures, it gets up to 20, 30, 40. And as I mentioned, that moderate zone, you get in this sweet spot right around here. And even though that's not going to release much nitrogen immediately to your current crop, it's going to have the greatest benefits to soil health. And it's also close to the maximum biomass that when the cover crop is flowering, in late flowering, it's pretty close to its maximum biomass. Now, if you let it get over mature, then you will tie up nitrogen, so you will hurt yourself in the short run. And this is slightly less beneficial to the soil health, again, is because there's not enough nitrogen for the soil life. So just a few words on the dry, I call it the dryland farmer's dilemma. It's that um, it's known, a number of studies have shown that when you just do a wheat fallow rotation, it depletes the soil. Even in no-till, you will see a decline in soil organic matter and several parameters of soil health. So, um, and this is a, a, a farm in, in Montana where they grow a very diverse rotation of grain, specialty grains and pulse crops. And that diversity alone enhances soil health. Now, if you go and plant a cover crop or a pulse crop for harvest in the off year, you will have that long-term improvement in soil health and water holding capacity. However, because the cover crop consumes moisture, any plant consumes moisture, um, it can reduce yields of the next uh, cereal grain crop. Now, results are very mixed. Um, I've had feedback from uh, some folks in NRCS where uh, both the short and long-term effects of adding that cover or other crop in the off year has been beneficial. It depends on a lot of factors on exactly how that crop is managed, on the uh, seasonal patterns of precipitation, uh, on the existing soil health, etc. Uh, and also the limited moisture can limit the cover crop itself. So um, care in choosing what cover crop you use is, is important. So um, sometimes the actual payoffs in soil health uh, take several years to accrue. So um, a few tips. Uh, winter pea has, uh, a green mineral winter pea has been shown to add more nitrogen and consume less moisture. It's actually compared to other uh, cover crops. Um, legumes. Uh, build the soil, but the yield effects can vary, as I mentioned, with the locale and with the exact cover crop species and the management. 
Another thing that came out of some of these studies is if you plant earlier and then terminate earlier, it relieves uh, competition for moisture and sustains grain yields. Um, and then, of course, in the long term, you're building uh, soil fertility and um, you may be reducing nitrogen requirements and in improving the moisture holding capacity of the soil so that if you get those infrequent heavy rains that some of the um, uh, drier regions of the interior west can get, um, the, the uh, healthy soil will hold on to that moisture more effectively. So this is an interesting paradox. It's the exact opposite paradox as we saw with the um, with uh, the broccoli. Uh, this was a study in Utah, uh, the Utah State University, where they took they applied compost just one time at a pretty heavy rate, 22 tons of dry matter per acre. Uh, so probably an inch layer of compost, and it was a manure compost with a nice medium um, uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio of 20. It was a manure bedding compost. And then they just watched soil health and yields over a 15-year period. Yields were doubled throughout that period, and at the end of the period, the compost-treated plots had twice the organic matter and definitely higher soil microbial and enzyme activities than the unamended. Yet, all those, the direct yield benefits failed to pay completely for the cost of that one-time application. So that's uh, another challenge that can arise. So a few research priorities for the Western region that I can see is um, how do you build and maintain soil health and fertility in the drier regions? And this could apply to dry land grains, dry land range, irrigated crops, and also um, optimizing the crop rotations and cover crops. Um, and fine tuning organic fertilizer recommendations across a tremendous diversity of soils, crops, and climates uh, that are encountered in the Western region. Particularly interesting areas, uh, this tightly coupled nutrient cycling, uh, some enzymes and gene regulated enzymes in the tomato root were found to be playing a role in the uh, root to uh, soil microbe communications that uh, promoted this tight cycling. Uh, the good news is that those genes seem to be of a type that is present in many plants and many plant families. So there's a good potential uh, to expand this concept and uh, develop practical applicable crops and soils and climates. And I think plant breeding for nutrient efficiency and especially for effective association with desirable soil organisms is especially potentially very fruitful. Uh, some information resources. Um, I'm over my time, so I won't dwell on these a long time, but um, I did find a lot of excellent resources for the Pacific Northwest, uh, and then also uh, for semi-arid regions, Montana State has some excellent uh, bulletins, and Utah uh, State University has uh, some really good information on tree fruit and vegetable production in that dry climate. Any questions? And those are the guys that are doing all the work for us. Okay, we're about to start our question and answer period, and we do have a couple questions in the queue already. Um, how do we measure whether we have good mycorrhizal fungi in orchard and vineyard systems? What specifically do we test for and uh, what labs do this kind of analysis? Uh, that's a good question. I, um, I'm, I'm afraid I do not have the answer to that. And that is, uh, that is an area of um, re practical research that is kind of in its infancy right now. Um, the... Uh, um, there is a lab called Earthfort. I believe it's still out there in Oregon. There are a few labs that, that do soil biology audits, and they will be able to look at plant root samples and tell you what percentage uh, colonization by mycorrhizal fungi are, is present. Uh, it is not widely available. All I can say is ask around. Okay, someone just typed in one called PFLA test um, at Ward Labs, W A R D. So, Great. Um, thanks for the comment. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, here's a comment. It just says, as a natal, native soil researcher, I really appreciated this discussion uh, on applied soil ecology and biogeochemistry in organic farming. So thank you for the comment. 
Um, oh, we had a question um, just basically about the regions that this webinar series is going to be covering um, because um, this person focuses on Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and New Mexico. And if this region isn't going to be addressed in these presentations, it would just be helpful for, for her to know that. So you have, I mean, I know it's the West is a huge area, so it's hard to cover everything, but do you just have any thoughts about that? Um, well, um, I think when it comes, we are going to have a cover crop webinar, and I will probably put more emphasis on those uh, more arid regions, how to approach that. Um, what would it say? It's Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and what was it, Arizona? Uh, let's see. She said Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and New Mexico. Yeah, uh, that is a really good point. Uh, as I was creating this webinar, I felt like, well, we really need two, one on the really dry regions and one uh, more on the Pacific Northwest and coastal California regions. Um, that is a really important consideration and, and one that I would like to address. But um, I would say we'll have to take that back to, um, to the, our team who has been making these webinars and see what, see what we can do about that. Okay, uh, yeah. I would say that um, I will keep that in mind in future webinars. Uh, another one that will really come up is water management. We'll certainly focus on the drier regions and, again, cover crops as well. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, we have another message here. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Just read about the meta studies on insect populations plummeting. Is there a faster and shorter path to slowing and stopping, reversing, and rebuilding? We, of course, are involved in the long game, but a glimmer of hope, please. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about that? On the insect declines? Yeah. That is something that's very worrisome. Unfortunately, I, well, I'm not an entomologist to begin with. And there's so much, only so much that I can pay attention to and keep up with, so then that's not one that I've done. Okay, I think he was looking for a hopeful <laughs> thought here. So. Uh, well, I could say the more you take care of your soil, the more you're contributing to um, slowing climate change as well as adapting to it. And uh, I think a lot of that insect population loss um, is related to climate. So if we as a human species can check climate change. And I think that sustainable agriculture is, is you know, a solid solution, but it will make significant contributions to ameliorating that problem. Um, let's see. So what methodology is being used to determine soil health and how can we utilize it in order to quantify improvement over time? Uh, well, there is the, um, uh, the Cornell assessment of soil health, that's, of course, out in uh, the Northeast, so it may not be quite as applicable in the West. Um, well, those, those, the, these, there are two pretty good parameters um, that have shown a good track record of correlating with organic matter and overall soil health. One is permanganate oxidizable organic matter. And although that's a form of active organic matter, that also seems to correlate well with the degree to which the soil life is effectively building stable organic matter. So it's a real, it's a monitor of that soil stabilization process. The other is the Solvita test or the respiration test. And that more directly estimates uh, mineralization. There's also a couple of protocols for potentially mineralizable nitrogen. It's, uh, they're a little, bit more, um, a little bit more involved because you have to take a soil sample and incubate it under very controlled laboratory conditions, under anaerobic conditions for a period of time, and then um, measure how much of the organic nitrogen has turned into ammonium nitrogen. Uh, I would say, you know, direct field observation is a good way. Uh, total organic matter is actually not a bad parameter. Um, it turns out that's fairly well correlated, uh, you know, just the organic matter in a soil test, although it's not a super precise number. Um, but just watching your soil, uh, you know, go out after a heavy rain, is it, is it soaking in pretty well? Uh, are you getting runoff? Are you getting a lot of ponding? Um, how are the crops responding? If, if you have a period of drought, 
and your crops look good and the neighbors are starting to look a little bit uh, peaked that suggests that your soil health is, is, uh, has improved or is better. And you can also just look at your own fields year to year and uh, just do those direct observations. Okay. This is an, an area that's of, it's an important area for research, how to develop methods that are both more accurate and are more readily applicable by the farmer, easy to use in the field. Okay, thank you. Um, if you do use manure, how um, do you eliminate pathogens such as E. coli and coliform? Okay, that's a good question. Um, well, the, uh, the organic standards require 120 days between application of manure or grazing of livestock in a field and harvest of an organic food crop. And although that isn't going to eliminate every single pathogen or, you know, cell, it, the data suggests that it will attenuate the levels very substantially. So it is a good general rule of thumb. If you just say, you know, whether you're certified organic or not, if you just follow that NOP rule at least 120 days, you know, one way to be sure to get uh, plenty of distance between your manure application and your um, uh, crop harvest is to apply the manure to a cover crop. Another way is to compost the manure, make sure it gets to 130 degrees and warmer and uh, for, for about 15 days. At that point, the 120-day uh, restriction no longer applies for NOP certification. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you um, tell us what the minimal temperature in which winter peas will not get winter killed? Well, in my personal experience, I've had three different occasions in my 20 years in Southwest Virginia where we had an exposed freeze of about minus five Fahrenheit, that would be minus 20 Celsius. And I had winter peas out there. And at first they looked like hell. They looked like they were destroyed. And in one case, you could barely see them. I couldn't tell if that was a pea plant, a veg plant or a clover seedling because uh, they'd been frozen to the ground. And then the other two cases, they just look kind of dead. And by the middle of May, I had a solid mass of peas up to my armpits. I mean, they just burst forth. This is Austrian winter pea. Uh, the good news is that there is quite a bit of breeding uh, research going on in cover crops, including Austrian peas, crimson clover, hairy vetch, and also uh, fava bean or bell bean, where they are trying to enhance the winter hardiness of these crops. And it's been quite effective. Uh, there are some lines of uh, fava bean uh, that survived minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit in Eastern Washington. Uh, they are just registered breeding lines are not yet released as varieties. I'm really uh, hoping they'll come out soon. Uh, but um, yeah, in my experience, Austrian peas will go down to zero uh, quite easy. It's good to have them mixed with a uh, grass cover crop because that prevents frost heaving so that the, the root crown stays viable. Uh, another thing is if you have a, a, a little bit of a cover crop that will winter kill, like oats, it'll create some mulch and that creates further protection. Okay. Um, can you clarify what's meant by soluble fertilizers versus other forms? Is this the same thing as fertigating and liquid fertilizer? Oh, good question. Uh, liquid, fer liquid organic fertilizers will be things like fish emulsion or uh, seaweed meal. And you can put... Uh, chili and nitrate in there, but mostly it's organic forms. When I talk about soluble fertilizer, I mostly refer to conventional fertilizers. Um, I, I, I admit, I probably use that term a little bit imprecisely. Soluble nitrogen is ammonium plus nitrate. It's the inorganic forms of nitrogen that plants take up and that are subject to uh, leaching and denitrification. Uh, phosphorus, um, Conventional phosphor fertilizers, they release phosphates. Now, these just have a, a low inherent solubility, so technically they're not that soluble, but they're inorganic forms. Uh, potassium exists as a positively charged ion, which is both soluble and readily adsorbed to cation exchange capacity, uh, either biological or clay-based. So um, when I say soluble fertilizers, I mostly mean things like 10-10-10, ammonium nitrate, potassium chloride, 
uh, superphosphate. Uh, basically, the conventional ones we don't see in organic systems. When I talk about soluble nutrients, I'm talking about the presence of um, the ammonium and the nitrate and also uh, plant available soluble phosphorus, which won't be at as high a concentration, but you, uh, that will also be present. Um, good question. That's, that's a good point to clarify. Okay. Um, for perennial crops like tree fruit, um, what are some good ways that we can test or get soil samples from the root zone without damaging the roots? We've run bulk soil tests, but I think we're missing a picture of what's happening in the root zone. Well, I think that if you've got a healthy crop and you take one core that's an inch in diameter, even a dozen cores around a tree, you're damaging such a tiniest trace, a fraction of the root system. And it's good to collect a little bit of the plant roots, especially if you're going to do a biological test like, like um, a mycorrhizal fungi. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you recommend some good amendments to boost up soluble carbon as a drip or drench? Um, would humic acid be good? Um, soluble carbon. You know what the best source of soluble carbon is? Root exudates. Now, I'm not going to put down things like humic acids and biochar and such. I just don't have enough personal experience with them and not enough knowledge of the research behind them. Although uh, I have biochar. I would say with something like humic acids, you're going to invest in it. Try a with versus without comparison. See if you get a benefit. If you do and it pays for itself, you're not going to do yourself any harm with humic acids. One thing I would note about humic acids is that the latest evidence is that the so-called humic acid or humus fraction in soil organic matter is an artifact of an older extraction method where you use really strong alkali, pH 13 or, or 0 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide to extract the organic matter. And then you suddenly acidify it to pH 1 with, with I'm not sure, sulfuric, one of the strong mineral acids. But these extreme swings in pH create these macromolecules that we call humic acids. Now, the product humic acid was probably created in a somewhat similar way. Um, and the evidence that I, would, that I have seen is that it may or may not be effective, but it's not harmful. Uh, so I would say just do a test, see if you get a benefit. But if you want soluble carbon to go to your soil life, Keep actively growing plants in your soil as much of the year as possible. And I understand if you're in a very dry zone, that will not be 12 months of the year, whereas if you have moderate to high rainfall climate, uh, it could be 12 months of the year, depending upon how cold the winter is. Okay. Um, do you recommend testing organic inputs, such as on-farm on produced compost and manure, et cetera, for their nutritional profile, or is it better to just test the soil before or after adding? Well, absolutely test your, your input, because then you know what you're putting on. That will really help be very helpful in fine-tuning uh, your application rates. Like if you have a soil that is high in phosphorus and you want to maintain it, but you don't want to push it any higher, and you want to know how much compost to apply, and you know you're harvesting off about 15 pounds of elemental phosphorus per acre every year, you will want to test your, soil, your compost and say, okay, I can put this many tons per acre on and not exceed 15 pounds per acre, uh, acre of uh, elemental phosphorus, and I'll know how much potassium I'm replenishing, how much micronutrients, et cetera. Okay. Um, let's see. Will there be a discussion of integrating grazing into the fertility and weed management of crop systems? Very good question. I know there have been some research um, out of Montana State University, uh, Dr. Fabian Manalit and, and others, on integrating sheep into uh, production systems. And yeah, we have an article about that, or uh, links to a video on our website um, on a e extension. So um, I'll see if I can dig up the link real quick to that while while you're talking. Yeah, uh, there have been mixed results. Um, I think the issue is they're trying to use the um, grazing in lieu of tillage. Um, I would say that as a whole, crop livestock integration systems have a tremendous um, potential to 
a closed nutrient cycle so that you will reduce the amount of, um, oh, there you go, grazing management and soil health. Yeah, it's known that well-managed grazing is excellent for soil health. So if you have a crop livestock integrated system, uh, in fact, I know of one out, uh, it's not the western region, but there's a, there's a farm in uh, Kentucky, um, Elmwood Stock Farm, where they do three years intensive vegetable or row crop production and followed by five years of management intensive rotational multi-species grazing. And the fields that are rotated into crops with considerable tillage three years out of eight have the same excellent soil health as the permanent pasture. So a uh, lot of potential there. Um, I think the re experience of the Montana State uh, researchers shows the importance of fine-tuning this system for um, uh, so that you can sustain yields and get the best results. And uh, grazers can be very good for managing certain weeds, uh, and it depends on the weed. If you've got a soft pigweed like uh, uh, smooth pigweed or uh, redroot pigweed, the livestock love it. If you've got a spiny one like spiny amaranth, <laughs> they become a pasture weed because they're not much fun to eat. <laughs> so, and I understand that there are a lot of really invasive exotic weeds in the um, uh, western rangeland, which are a real problem. I am not uh, highly expert on that issue. Something I want to learn more about. Okay, um, in high pH soils greater than seven point five, what would be the best source of phosphorus? Would it be guano or fish bone meal? How well does a buckwheat cover crop? do in improving phosphorus availability? I did see one research study on that that indicated that neither buckwheat nor the standard materials like rock phosphate that organic farmers use are all that effective. However, some formulations that combined organic acids, and I don't know what organic acid, but some way to acidify the phosphorus material itself helps solubilize it. I think that there's a research frontier here. If there's such things as mycorrhizal fungi that do well at pH 75, 8, 8, 5, that, that range that can occur in the uh, drier regions of the West, they will be a very important ally. Um, as I mentioned, my own soil here at home, now granted it's pH 6.5, it's just perfect. Um, tests low in phosphorus, but the plants get enough often mycorrhizal tests, but I assume that some form of soil life is helping the crops uh, get what they need. Um, that is a really good question, and it's one that has had some research and requires more. Uh, probably, if you have access to manure, uh, particularly if you have, a, a, if you maybe banned apply uh, an organic source of phosphorus like manure, that may be help. Uh, that may uh, help provide the plant with more nutrition. Also, anything to build up the plant's capacity to enter into mycorrhizal uh, relationships uh, should help. Okay. <laughs> Someone's asking if you've ever come up to the Okanagan Valley in BC. <laughs> no, I've not been there. Okay. In British Columbia? <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I see a question here about oh, uh, I compost. See one more, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, compost tea with soil health. Um, I know there's been a lot of work with that, and some people use compost tea as a drip fertigation. Uh, it, what, it does, what compost tea does is it concentrates the beneficial microbes in the compost, and whenever you put an inoculant, a microbial inoculant into the soil, it's going to be beneficial if the soil is lacking the functions of those particular microbes, and it's going to be no effect if the soil is already got those functions, or if the soil has organisms that are antagonistic to uh, those, um, those organisms. Either of those can happen. So uh, there is a study out, uh, there's a network out in Ohio State, again, not the western region, but um, it's a network of researchers and farmers that is researching the um, efficacy of different microbial inoculants. Okay, we have one final question here. Um, to some industry folks, and she's thinking particularly of potatoes, um, soil health is assumed to mean a lack of pathogen pressure. Can you comment on this different approach to defining soil health? Is that plant pathogen or human pathogen? I assume it's plant pathogen. 
Um, what happens in a, in a healthy soil on the whole, you will tend to have less crop disease because there are so many good bugs that the bad bugs just don't have room to multiply. It's not that they're absent, it's just that they, uh, they don't multiply. Um, let's see, if the soil is low pH 5, well, what effects of a composted tree mulch could I expect? If you got hardwood trees, hardwood residues surprisingly will become alkalizing in the long run. If it's conifers, if it's pine, fir, dug fir, et cetera, it'll probably be acidifying. Uh, but that, that's a good question about soil health. Uh, that is one of the dimensions of soil health, that, the, that the, um, uh, you have fewer plant diseases. And it's not going to be one-on-one. -on -one. You can have a generally healthy soil and plant five crops, and four of them will do pretty well, and their common diseases will not be a major issue, and the fifth one may come down with it really bad. Uh, so it's not, a, uh, it's not a surefire thing, but on the other hand, on the whole, uh, on the average, you get better. Um, you you do get better soil health. I mean, you do get better uh, better disease control in a biologically active soil. Okay, and since we have one more minute, we might as well ask one more question. Um, okay. Would mixing elemental sulfur and rock phosphate be effective on high pH soils for increasing phosphorus availability? Placed in a band. I'd say good research question, <laughs> and go out and try it. Uh, you don't want to do too much elemental sulfur because it does turn to sulfuric acid gradually over a long period of time. So you want to calibrate it so that maybe you're only using a couple hundred pounds per acre. So I don't know. You do maybe do it a one to one or one part sulfur to two parts phosphate. I would say you just have to go out there and experiment. Just do it on a small scale. So um, if it backfires, you only lose a couple of crop rows. Okay, well, we are out of time. Thank you, everyone, for um, typing in all these questions. So thank you again, Mark, for a great presentation sure. and discussion. And uh, we hope you can all join us for the many other webinars that we have scheduled this season in this series. And we also have many other webinars um, on other topics, which you can find by just searching in your browser under webinars by eOrganic. So thanks to everyone for coming today.